Welcome everyone to the first webinar in our three-part webinar series titled Informal Caring Burden in HTA, Current Challenges and Future Opportunities. This series, which has been commissioned and funded by Roche, will explore the consideration of informal care in health technology assessment. This first webinar will examine what's meant by care a burden and why it might be important to consider in HTA. The following two webinars take place next week. The second webinar will focus on how care of burden is captured in HTA and will cover some of the existing challenges. The third and final webinar will look ahead and consider the future for capturing care of burden in HTA. We have a fantastic selection of speakers for these webinars and today we'll hear from two of them. So first up we'll have Portia Foreman who is advocacy lead with Spinal Muscular Atrophy UK and one of two UK delegates at SMA Europe. Portia has a bachelor's degree in psychology, is a qualified primary teacher, and has four children. Her youngest child, Ezra, has SMA type 1. And since his diagnosis, Portia has shared her experiences on social media and has worked to increase awareness of SMA generally. Our second speaker will be Chris Schedule. He's a director at the Office of Health Economics. He's worked in academia and consulting, and his interests center around health economic evaluation and preference licitation to understand the value of different health technologies and outcomes to patients and society. His recent work includes research around the relative priority for rare or severe conditions and unmet needs, patient and societal willingness to pay for fertility treatments, and the care equality trap, which you'll hear about next week. So after the presentations from Portia and Chris, we'll have a question and answer session. This is going to be interactive, so we're going to ask the questions that are posed by you, the audience members, so please do submit any questions during or after the presentations, and don't forget to upvote the questions you'd most like to see answered. So without further ado, our first speaker for today is Portia Foreman, who's going to draw upon her own experience to explain what it means to be an informal carer and the impact that it can have. So over to you, Portia. Hello everyone, um, my name is Portia Thorman and I am advocacy lead at the charity Spinal Muscular Atrophy UK. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the very important topic of the burden of the informal carer. As well as being advocacy lead at SMA UK, I am um, what we might call an informal carer um, for my son, Ezra, who you can see here. Now, Ezra lives with spinal muscular atrophy type one, and um, my life and the life of my family completely changed um, when he was diagnosed in 2016. So here I am, before I knew what I had coming to me, um, uh, pregnant with Ezra. So this would have been yep, 2016 in the winter. I think it's really important when thinking about becoming a carer and, and how that puts a burden on your life, the process sort of leading up to that. So was it an expected thing? Um, caring for our parents, for example, when, when they get old, that's, that's expected. And you would hope that it was planned for. Um, having a baby, as I was about, very much about to hear, um, it was expected. I would planned to be the carer of that baby for a defined amount of time. And at, the, at this point, I'm very much content. Now, I've written the title here, My Mental Health Journey Through the Diagnostic Odyssey, because that period of, of coming up to diagnosis um, is full of mental health struggles, I would say. So my son was born in a very normal way. He was born in a birthing pool. There weren't any complications. He, um, he didn't breathe immediately after being born, but you know, that can be considered as normal. He probably didn't move as much as um, my other children, but I was so busy. I'm a mum of four. So this Ezra was my, my last child. And probably because of that, as he, in his first few weeks, there was suspicion there. And he ended up in PICU with a cold, actually, at five weeks old. He couldn't cope with a cold. And we were there for his first Christmas. So that immediately split our family up. And I actually remember looking around the PICU ward and thinking, well, thank goodness it's not a long-term condition. Thank goodness I don't have the burden of that on my life. And then when we finally got home in the new year, um, that sort of suspicion turned to desperation. 
especially when um, health professionals weren't really listening to me. And I saw three separate health visitors. I saw GP and all of them put his symptoms down to the fact that he'd been so poorly. Um, but when it got to the point where he couldn't move his legs, he couldn't lift his arm to his mouth, um, we finally got a referral because I just went in and cried and I was in pieces. After the refer referral, after the diagnosis, um, it then turned to denial. You know, this is a genetic condition. We don't have any history of it in our family. Um, he, he, he's still feeding, surely not, it can't be that. And we had the two week wait for the blood test to come through to confirm the diagnosis. And at that point you move into despair. And like, how am I gonna cope with this? Am I ever gonna work again? How is this gonna affect my family? Is he gonna live? Is he gonna die? And, and right back in 2016, treatments were all very early. So no one really knew what the prognosis was for our son, which has a huge impact on your mental health, whether you're making the right ethical decision for your son and not being overburdened by that emotion, that, that selfish choice that you want to keep him because he's your son. Once you learn to live with that fear um, and you deal with that fear, well, if you can deal with that fear, and many people don't ever deal with the fear, um, but I was fortunate enough to be able to move to a place of hope and acceptance and, and really try and make the best of every moment I have. So much of his first three years of life were spent in hospital. Now this comes, we had, 10 PICU admissions in, his, in the first three years. That's a, a long way from home for us because we live um, on the tip of Kent and the specialist hospital is in London. So it's a long time away from home. Um, when we have other children, you can't, you can't be together because someone needs to carry on the normal day-to-day -day tasks. More mental health burden, I think, in this stage was you know, accepting that we, we'd chosen to have a treatment and you want to have that fills you with hope for the future and probably the the unknown from us and the clinicians nobody knew what would happen meant that I could keep that hope but then at the same time we had to accept a referral to palliative care that was very difficult to accept and I had to do it to get treatment so that meant I had to speak to, to counsellors and I was very anti speaking to palliative care counsellors because I felt like that was accepting he was going to die. So I only did what I had to do to get the treatment and no more than that. And no other form of counselling was offered to me or to my family. Um, and I think that thinking about these labels like palliative care, same with the hospice actually, when Demelza offered help, um, I was very anti it because I didn't want to go into hospice and I thought I'd just be around dying children. Moving forward, the hospice has been a really good, a good support when I finally accepted it. And it's not like that at all. It's actually a really fantastic place. So I think these these words like palliative and hospice really do have a negative effect on, on one's mental health when, when caring for someone like I've had to. So, yeah, life became very medicalized very quickly. Um, I had to learn lots of new, new terminology, I had to do lots of reading up on the condition and you really have to become an expert in the person you're caring for. Like I was the expert in my son. There's no formal carer that knew my son like I know. And as soon as he would get a cold, you had to know, you had to recognize his breathing pattern. You had to know his mood really well to know what the slight changes were, especially with SMA, because the fragile SMA children like my son, they go downhill so very quickly. You know, they can be out at the park in the morning and then in PIC, PICU in the evening. Um, that is the reality, that was the reality of it for us. So being an informal carer, I was an expert in him and I knew the slightest change um, and I knew what to do about that. And that's a huge learning curve and it had to happen very quickly. Um, so the impacts on the family, has to be considered, I think. Uh, so this is my family here. You can see um, Martha is my youngest. So at the time, she was three years old when, when Ezra was diagnosed. Now, with much of Ezra's first two to three years of life, me living in London and my husband looking after the children at home, she really did almost forget who I was because that's a long time for a, for a little girl's life. 
and um, they would come to see me at the odd weekend once we got a place in um, Ronald McDonald house. And she would keep calling me Maisie, who is my eldest daughter. And she really would go to Maisie for all the things that she should go for her mum for. Like she, we kind of lost that bond, which um, I found that really difficult. Um, and then of course my eldest daughter, um, with the long blonde hair here sitting on the end, she became Martha's primary carer because my husband was working every day. And the whole dynamic of the family changes. Um, uh, she was actually doing her GCSEs at the time as well. So it had a huge impact on her. And she, she did very well. She would bring her books into intensive care and the nurses would help her out. And I think that atmosphere in PICU is one I had never imagined. But when you're there so much um, and you get put on a team of nurses, so when you go back, you always have the same person. Um, that really helped us as a family. And we almost sort of lost perspective of what PICU was. And, you know, we'd be having a giggle and new parents would come in with their, you know, children really critically ill and look around the corners and see us giggling. It, it was all really messed up, but it, it really helped. It really helps having those relationships. And PICU did become normalized for us, which in a way kept us going. Um, my next daughter sitting on the end here with the curly red hair, she was going through real difficult times at school. So she was being bullied. She was going through some real serious self-esteem stuff. And had I been there, I probably would have noticed it more. Um, but my husband was so busy. She really was left to deal with it herself. And she was very vulnerable. And to be honest, she still suffers with that now. So now she's 19. She got through her A-levels, but she hasn't gone to university because she doesn't have the confidence with people. Um, it's really held her back. She is on regular antidepressants. And I think if I had been there at this, at the crucial time, it could have been a different story for her. Um, my husband, obviously working full time, trying to you know keep doing his job and look after all the kids, do the cooking, do the school run, I think, mean, we were part of a church then that would bring meals around for us. And that's really in that real desperate phase. That's the only way that we could keep going because we had a really good support network. And I know lots of people that don't have that support network. And and when some crisis hits like this, it does pull families apart entirely. And it's really important that, that there is a good support network in place. Um, my husband actually also in the same week we got um, our son's diagnosis, he lost his brother. He was only 18, 18 months younger than him, so we're very close. And he got um, knocked off his bike by a van and died instantly in the same week. So it's like all these other things still go on in life, all these other tragedies. And we happen to have so many at the same time, but because of that sort of port network, network we were able to come through the other side. Um, I don't want to spend a long time on the financial burden of caring because I think everybody knows and everybody is well aware that it does have this huge impact on you financially. Um, we've actually found being a family that's not relying on benefits, but also, you know, we don't have lot, pots of money and loads of savings that we're actually in this sort of like gap where we almost miss out because we're not entitled to lots of things that other people are entitled for, and yet we can't afford to do them ourselves. Um, at the time of diagnosis, I was obviously on maternity leave. I used to be a primary school teacher. And because we had treatment, we had hope that I would be able to go back to work, but we didn't really know what we ought to do. Um, so when I decided that, you know, he, I had no choice but to give up my job, it's a very sudden loss of earnings. Um, we have you know, we have our own house, we have mortgage commitments that was dependent on two earners. Um, when I was teaching, I taught part time. So I taught three days a week, three and a half days a week. So I was earning 400 pounds a week. And that is instantly cut to 69 pounds 70, the carer's allowance. And because my husband earns fairly good money, we weren't entitled to any other benefits. So we had this, this gap, whilst even whilst care allowance was processed, where we we had to rely on um, friends and family to help us out. And it's really difficult. There has been a survey done from the Carers Trust, and you can see a few statistics here about 
the financial burden of caring and it is a real real issue and one that lots of charities are on and advocating for I think so as Ezra grew up um it sort of moved out of hospital as he grew bigger his his tubes grew bigger and he was able to cope with most colds I think in his third year of life, we only had one admission to PICU, which was a huge improvement. And it enabled us to sort of settle into this new normal, I like to call it, um, that to so many things to adjust to. Um, housing adaptations, even just having a little, little curb on your step. Um, you know, we had to get adaptations so he could get in, get out. We have a lift that you can see here that takes him down to the garden. And this is another financial burden that, that does weigh heavily, but you could get 30,000 pounds, which is fantastic. But that lift alone costs 12,000 um, pounds. So we had the lift and the, uh, the entrance and the exit into the garden done. And, and that was the grant swallowed up. So we still don't have a downstairs bathroom. Um, I'm still having to carry my son up the stairs every time he needs a bath and you know, he has to go to the toilet on a commode downstairs and he's six now. So, you know, it's difficult and he needs his own space. Um, but it's such a huge amount of money that you need to do it. And you do feel a responsibility that you're not, you know, doing the best for them. Um, but we've done what we can. And he doesn't seem to mind at the moment. Um, you can see the amount of specialist equipment we have there. So that's a standing frame, a supportive seating that moves up and down. Um, his self-propelled wheelchair and his power chair. So, I mean, if you're in a very small house, it's very difficult um, to cope with the, you know, the lack of space for all this stuff. We had to learn how to use um, all this respiratory equipment that you come home with. You're suddenly your house is like a hospital. Um, and, you know, there are procedures that even are the nurses in our local children's ward aren't trained to do. They're quite specialist invasive procedures. So he has a ventilator at nighttime. He has a cough assist machine, which brings up the gunk because he doesn't have a strong enough cough. And then we have to put a suction catheter, which is like a very thin tube up to 12 centimeters down his nose. So it's, it's invasive, it's not comfortable for him. And as, as a, as a mum, I have to, I've learned, I think, my coping strategy is to just take off my mum hat and put on my nurse hat and I try and you know remain detached emotionally when I'm doing these procedures and that's really what's seen me through um, but I'm very fortunate that I'm able to do that and I know lots of families that find it much more difficult we have to constantly monitor his his um, saturations um, his oxygen saturations and it's really thanks to this is the only photo I had of all, all Ezra's all Ezra's nurses together so we have uh, two night nurses and another one who does nights now and then. And um, so we got all together for nights and days when he's at school, a team of five nurses. And you have to accept these people into your home. And for me, they have to become like part of the family. I have to be able to trust them um, without question so that I can get a good night's sleep. Um, we're very lucky that we've got a package of care where um, you know, I love all his nurses and they're absolutely fantastic and they have stuck with us. That is not the norm, sadly. And I think one of the biggest burdens for families is not being able to get the care that they need and sometimes not being able to trust them. I know families that have a nurse sitting up with their child all night, but if that child needs some sort of procedure, they will um, they will want to be woken up and, and to be the ones doing it. So I think being able to trust that Form, more formal care help that you get is really important for for living a sort of mentally well well um, life and they really have been able to, they've enabled me to have a, my career back really those nurses and it really is a fantastic and I wish that that was the experience for everyone but sadly it's not um tube feeding um one was one of the hardest things to accept actually that my son would never be able to eat because it's such a it's such a big social thing, isn't it, eating, especially in our house. Um, any gathering is all about eating. So that was another thing I had to really work through in my mind um, that, you know, he, he's at least he hasn't had it and then lost it. I would try and justify all the reasons why it's not going to be that bad and always try to think about the positives in the situation. Um, 
but it's it's difficult tube fitting having to drag that around with you everywhere you go um there's lots of orthotics equipment this is his picture of his cathode here um he has very stiff knees he's um got a lot of contractures in his knees so he has to have regular physiotherapy and that's another thing that burdens me um in particular because he isn't getting the physiotherapy that he needs and i know there are many families that can afford to pay privately for physiotherapy and i see their children doing better and i know you shouldn't compare but you always uh, it's easy to sort of blame yourself saying oh he's not he's not doing as well because they've had physio from so young um and it's a difficult one because there's just not the capacity in the nhs so we have to do it at home and we have to be on it and keep stretching him and, and ensuring that every day we're doing activities that are improving and strengthening his muscles um transport i very very recently um Going, going to get a WAV, which I'm quite excited about. Didn't want to do it before I really needed it, but now you really need it. Um, so yep, the, the WAV is coming. And again, we have to pay out for that because we're not on benefits. So I have to pay the 5,000 pounds down payment, whereas someone on benefits doesn't pay that at all. There doesn't seem to be any intermediate, which is a shame. There he is. He's very excited about his WAV. And then moving on to the social impact. Um, it's an interesting one to talk about because I think it's such a devastating diagnosis that friends kind of don't know how to talk to you anymore because they just come across as feeling sorry for you, which isn't what anybody wants. Um, and so rather than some people, rather than address the awkward conversation they'd rather just not talk about it at all <laughs> so you do find that you lose quite a lot of people from your life because you don't have that regular contact anymore of course covid as well impacted on that um we've got a picture here of, of a list and this is the list of things that i have to write down before we go away and this doesn't include any of the sort of normal um child stuff so we've got a very long list of medical equipment. And if you forget anything, it, you know, it's really bad news. It's not like you can just pop down the shop to get some SATS probes or get his feed or any of it. So it's really quite a stressful process. And I have to make sure I draw little boxes here so I can tick it when I've packed it and then cross it off when I put it in the car. So from someone who historically was quite disorganized and messy, Looking at the um, the pros of, of how my life has changed, I'm definitely a more organised person and you have to become this sort of strategic manager of life. Um, so we have to do this for any holidays. Um, days out have become easier, I would say, as he's got bigger and less vulnerable. Children's parties are difficult um, as it goes to a mainstream school. Obviously, all the parents are aware of his limitations but you know he still gets invites to the soft play center and that's great i'm glad that they invite him but he can't access everything and i do feel sad for him um and that burdens me as well but it gives me the opportunity to make sure that his parties are the most inclusive ones that we can do and that he gets a chance um child is difficult obviously you can't just get anyone in to babysit you have to be very much very highly trained to look after my son and um, the nursing agency, thankfully, we now have them seven nights a week, but there still has to be someone with parental responsibility in the house. So it's very difficult for me and my husband to go out together ever. And I think you really have to concentrate on working on your on your marriage and your relationships because of that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a huge, huge impact on, on one's social life. This is the comment that I, I probably get the most um, is, I don't know how you do it. Oh, you're amazing. How do you do it? And it's the comment I hate the most as well, because it's not something that you choose to become an informal carer. Um, you know, I didn't choose to give up my, my teaching career and um, care for my son. But if I was to say, how do I do it? I think number one would be losing that fear. And I, I know that it's almost a supernatural thing to be able to say that you've lost the fear. And I'm very conscious that I don't say uh, the word I'm worrying about because I've learned that worry is completely pointless. 
um, sharing experiences and journeys with other SMA families has been really important. I think the networks I've built up with families have really helped me and there's something very special about just being in a room with people that understand and any opportunity that can be used to build that I think is really good. Also aware though that other families find it very overwhelming and, and don't like to be involved in the community and I think those are the kind of people that I try to always dip in just to make sure they're okay. Um, always thinking out of the box, I want to make sure that my son has you know, as much opportunity as he possibly can to enjoy his childhood. Um, now this means that my back suffers, <laughs> as you can see. I've used a um, baby sling to try and get as involved in as, as many inaccessible sort of activities as possible even trampolines and you know I'm always weighing up the, the the risk factor you're sort of constantly risk assessing I know um a lot of SMA mums would say what the heck are you doing with your son out to sea on an inflatable <laughs> um but you know I've assessed the risk I know that I can keep him safe and and that's an individual choice and it's it's really important to me that we do these things my husband's an avid um fisherman you can see in that picture there he's fishing and uh, he was always looking forward to having his first boy and taking him fishing and um, you know we make it happen even if it's just me taking him out there and he sits there for 20 minutes and then I take him home it's just you know making the best of it I really I really think is how I do it and we just take each day as it comes I try not to think about the future I try not to think about, you know, when I have to have hoists installed in my home and I, I can no longer lift him. Um, you know, we take it as it comes and we'll do it in an organised way. But it is all worth it. And, you know, every birthday brings us such joy. You can see him here with his little friend um, who I've met his mum through an SMA network. And these two boys in the same little power chairs zooming around weather spoons together I know you just couldn't be filled with more joy when you know that maybe if he was born a couple of months earlier he wouldn't be here at all so it is all worth it and um yeah my back may not agree but um he does bring us so much joy that's it thank you for listening thank you so much Portia for sharing your experience with us um, I think your presentation really clearly illustrated the breadth of the impact that diseases such as SMA can have on families. Um, in our next presentation, Chris Schedule is going to describe the extent of the carer burden in the UK as a whole and reflect on whether it should be routinely considered in HTA. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, David, and, and thank you, Portia, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to speak about why carer quality of life should matter in HTA. So Portia has given us some uh, understanding of what these burdens of, of informal caring are. I would like to speak in a more technical sense of why HTA should take some account of, of these effects when they evaluate the value of new medicines. So as a brief outline of what I want to talk about, I will discuss the economic value of informal care. Um, I will recap some of the, the burdens of informal care in a, in a much um, less insightful way, perhaps, than, than Portia has already done. I will discuss why it's important to value reductions in the, in the burden of caring via HTA. Briefly discuss what some of the unresolved issues are in this area. And then um, I'd like to have a quick poll at the end of, of this presentation that I'll ask David to present. Uh, and as a quick disclaimer, I, I need to express that these are my opinions and not necessarily those of Roche or OHE. So the economic value of informal or unpaid care is significant. The UK Office of National Statistics suggests that the value of informal caring in 2014 was 57 billion pounds or more than 3% of GDP. Separately, and around the same time, Carers UK suggested the value of informal caring was up to £132 billion, or almost as much as the total UK health spend in 2015. So both of these graphs highlight the impact and, and the substantial value that unpaid carers are contributing to society and, and contributing effectively to the NHS. 
but the discrepancy um, carries UK estimates a number that's three times higher than the Office of National Statistics, highlights the challenge that we have understanding exactly what the financial contribution of informal caring is and, and just how much of a burden this is placing on society and the carers themselves. So there is the idea of the financial value um, to, to the NHS, the value of this care that, that otherwise would be provided by formal carers such as nurses or um, care within the NHS is, is being provided by these informal carers. So in addition to the monetary value of this care, we also should take into account the fact that it involves millions of individuals and accounts for billions of hours of their time. Literally billions of hours of their time uh, are, are spent caring for patients that would otherwise need to be looked after within the NHS or other national healthcare systems. So I think this, is, this in itself is a strong argument for why it's important to consider the value of informal caring as part of the health technology assessment that we're doing. The, as we can see here, the, this, this NHS budget is updated to 22 23, um, to the fiscal year 22 23. And we can say that from the CARES UK estimate, it's, it's almost the same size as the NHS budget in 2022. So this is, this is a substantial resource that people are effectively volunteer, voluntarily contributing to the NHS. And this resource should be seen as scarce and as valuable as any other healthcare, as any other health service within the system. So it's, it's critical that we take this, the value of this care into account because in the absence of considering this care, there is the potential that the NHS intentionally or unintentionally sees value in downloading more and more care onto informal carers who, who are not always in a, in a position to take on some of this care. So, like I said, we need to treat this care as, as scarce and as valuable as any other healthcare resource. Beyond the impact on patients' finance, uh, sorry, on, on carers' finances and on their, their direct time, there are a lot of spillovers beyond the effects that, that they have just in that immediate carer patient relationship. So, we can recognize that carers are making an investment of their valuable time in looking after a friend or a loved one. There are physical and emotional impacts associated with that investment of time and their caring. There is potentially out-of-pocket expenses that they have to pay in order to look after the person that they're caring for in a more effective way. Equally, there may be lost income because they're unable to work or unable to work as much as they were before they took on these caring roles. And there are indirect productivity losses to society. If, if a carer can't come in to do their job in the workplace, society misses out on the, the formal value of that carer's time. They may be um, otherwise volunteering in a, in a capacity that would add value to society. There are lots of spillover effects of looking after a patient with a particular condition. So um, a lot of these points come from a, a paper by Al Janabi. Um, there are others that make similar points. So there is a consensus that caring is, is, goes beyond that individual relationship between the patient and the carer and can potentially have a lot of uh, effects wider in the system. So if we understand the value of this care, the, the, the pure economic value of the care, also the, the emotional and the health impact of this care on the patient, but also on the carer, it's important that we should want to take these values and these burdens into consideration when we consider the value of new medicines, of, of new healthcare technologies. So part of what we want to understand in any HTA is what, of the value, what is the value of what we are foregoing as a result of choosing to use our resources in a different way. So as I said on the previous slide, one of the things we could be foregoing is the opportunity for some of these informal carers to do volunteer work, to do work, um, to, to enjoy their own time essentially. And then also perhaps society is missing out on some element of their productivity. So there are activities and, and valuable activities that are being displaced by the fact that they are spending their time um, looking after a patient. 
This is not, of course, to say that all of these burdens are necessarily negative. There is obviously potentially emotional value that comes from knowing that you are caring for a friend of yours, a loved one of yours, a family member of yours, that not all of these impacts are necessarily negative. So part of the part of one of the challenges that I will come to later in the in the presentation is just how to how to understand the relative costs and benefits of this sort of care. So what we would like to achieve in health technology is making sure that we are using the, the scarce and limited resources that we have available in the most efficient way possible. Are we, are we putting them to their most valuable use? So what we would like to understand in the context of care or quality of life, if there is a new treatment available, a new process of treatment, a new health technology that reduces the burden that we are placing on informal carers, we want to understand what is the value of that reduction in burden on carers to society more broadly or to the health care system more particularly. So the challenge of uh, the, the risk of not including care or quality of life in our health technology assessment is that we, we overlook accidentally or not accidentally the fact that, that one decision within the system may put a burden on people outside the system. The goal then, I think, what we're arguing for in this, in the context of this presentation is the idea of expanding the scope of our assessment to include all the people that are affected by a particular choice of how to deliver care and how to deliver treatment to, to patients. So we want to make sure that every resource, including the carer's time, is, is used as efficiently as possible. As I said, part of the challenge here is understanding what exactly is it that we are trying to achieve with the, the way we currently have the healthcare system organized. Are we trying, starting from the right-hand side of, of these choices, are we trying to maximize purely the patient's well-being? Um, you know, a, a single patient comes to the hospital and we do everything that we can do for that patient, even if perhaps it puts some burdens on on the wider network here, on, on their carers, on their family, and even on society. Alternatively, as we work our way to the left, are we interested in, in maximizing different conceptions of well-being? So in this second category, can we imagine that we're maximizing somehow the, the well-being associated with a particular treatment, where that treatment includes the effect on the person who has to look after the patient, on the informal carer? Equally, we can go even more widely than that. Are we interested in maximizing what we might call network well-being? So this includes the carer directly caring for the patient, but maybe also other family members within the household. You could imagine uh, a condition that, that affects one of your siblings, potentially has, a, has an effect on other siblings, other children within the home. So are we interested in trying to maximize the network effect, the, the network well-being even if they're not directly involved in care. And in the most broad conception, are we interested in maximizing societal well-being? So both in terms of the, the productivity that, that a carer who is otherwise looking after a patient could have contributed to broader society, but also understanding that society may prefer um, an arrangement, a state of the world where informal carers aren't necessarily put into this sort of a situation where, um, where they're forced forced either voluntarily or not to look after um, a, a patient or a loved one. So there are different conceptions of, of what it is we're trying to achieve within the healthcare system and therefore what it is that should be the objective of health technology assessment. And um, David will come back to this in a moment. So if we, we believe that society's objective is to, is something broader than solely maximizing the well-being of the patient. It's hard to see any justification for not routinely considering carer burden within HTA. Like I say, informal caring contributes a lot of value um, alongside our formal healthcare budgets. So we can see that, that as a proportion, the value that informal carers contribute is quite substantial next to what the, the formal sector is contributing. And at the same time, it's affecting the, the health, the well-being, the productivity of some of these carers, family networks, and broader society. 
So there is value and there is burden in the caring that they're providing. So like any other healthcare resource, our goal should make sure it should be to make sure that it is valued and that it's utilized as efficiently as possible. And as we're going to discuss in subsequent sessions of this webinar series, there are challenges around how we conceptualize and incorporate the value of that care and its burdens into HTA. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Chris, for that informative presentation. Um, so before we move on to the Q&A session, um, you may have seen already, we have a poll uh, relating to, to Chris's presentation, um, which hopefully you should see now. If you don't, you can select the poll tab at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, so as you can see, the question is, what do you see as the primary objective of HGA? Uh, the options here being maximizing qualities for everyone, so maximizing societal qualities, maximizing network qualities. So what Chris meant by that is the qualities of patient and their family ne network, uh, maximizing treatment qualities. Um, so by this, um, Chris meant uh, patients and informal carers, and then just maximizing patient qualities. And I have to say, this is a pretty interesting set of results already, which should provide um, some discussion points for us. Uh, so by far and away, the majority of people are saying the primary objective of HDA should be maximizing societal qualities, uh, which I think is in contrast perhaps to what's what's actually happening in practice. So only a few people saying we should focus on patient qualities or patient plus care qualities, uh, which is very interesting. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to our Q&A session now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is an interactive session and we'll be posing questions that have been submitted from you, the audience. Um, you can see the existing questions and submit your own by selecting the Q&A tab on the bottom right of your, of your screen. And I can see that we've had a couple come through already. Um, and so if you could think about any other questions that you have and submit those, and if you uh, really want to see a question answered, don't forget to cast an upvote as well. So I think before I get into the audience questions, I'll give you a bit more bit more time to add yours. I'm going to put my colleague Chris on the spot here and ask, what what do you make of the poll findings, and do you do you agree? Um, yeah, I, I think the short answer would be yes. Um, I think focusing on simply the patient's qualities without understanding, and I, and I don't mean to to load the responsibility on the patient, but rather, I don't think it's fair to to load the responsibility of how the health system delivers care on simply to the um, to the patient and and perhaps their carer. That if if we live in a in a system where we have a national health system, we should seek to, to maximize the national well-being, I think is probably the simplest way to frame that. It's Chris and Portia, what, what do you make of the results? I know in your presentation, you sort of highlighted the impact um, that, that Ezra's SMA had on not just you, but your, your whole family. So would you agree as well with the, these poll results? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. I think the the repercussions of informal care um, and the burden it, um, are much, much wider than just the, pa the patient and that immediate carer. Um, yeah, it seems crazy that they're only looking at the patient, really. Yeah, yeah, and there has been some suggestion as well I've seen from HTA sort of methods guidance and thinking around this that when you are thinking about the impact on others, it should maybe re be restricted to what's kind of been slightly vaguely defined as a primary informal carer rather than yeah. perhaps multiple informal carers or even a family beyond that. So yeah, it's quite a narrow perspective taken at the moment. Yeah. All right. Uh, so audience questions, I'm going to pick the one with the most upvotes. So the first question we've got here is, I think it may be partly two questions. So it's how do we ensure the consistency of application of care or quality of life, uh, presumably in, in, in technology appraisals. Uh, so research has shown a huge over-reliance on outdated data and not um, 
necessarily data that's relevant to the therapy area that's under consideration. Um, Chris, would you like to take that one first? Um, so first of all, I, I think that perception is, I would agree with that perception. Um, I think there's probably a, um, a chicken and egg problem that until there is a clear justification, a clear motivation for collecting better data, we won't have better data as soon as, sorry, I shouldn't say as soon as, but once HCA sends a signal that, that this is something that they will take into serious consideration and, and consider as part of the value of a new treatment or a new treatment process, then I think we will start to see that data quality improve. Yeah, absolutely. So another question from the audience that, that we have. Um, so they say, given the focus here um, and the number of publications, articles, posters, and so on from uh, conferences like ISPO Europe um, last November, uh, from different stakeholders on, on this particular topic, considering carer, the impact on carers in, in HTA, uh, how has the system or decision makers like NICE responded to the inclusion of more formalized considerations of care or quality of life? Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to speak on behalf of NICE, uh, but making it clear that these are my impressions, um, I think they are still struggling a little bit, maybe even in the context of the whole question of you know, what exactly is it that we are trying to achieve with with national healthcare, but within an HTA? Is it to maximize the, the, the health of the patient, the health of the patient plus the carer? Is it potentially even broader than the concept of health? And is it that we're trying to maximize the well-being of, of any number of individuals within the system? So I think... To, to be positive, I think NICE is making a legitimate effort to think about this problem and is simply recognizing that there, that it's a complicated problem. Um, we don't have all the tools and all the data that we would like to have in order to address some of these questions, some of these problems. But my feeling is that it is NICE is taking the problem seriously and and thinking about it in more in more depth, in a, in a less positive light, perhaps. Um, some of the some of the definitions of of what um, nice, for example, uses a, a definition that says it has to have a care quality has to have a significant impact on the outcome of this analysis before we'll take it into account. But they've never really defined exactly what significant impact means in that context. So I think just cleaning up around the edges and encouraging more encourage. Showing more routine consideration will encourage, in turn, I think, more routine data collection that will will address some of the data issues that we're seeing. Some of them are are deeper and more fundamental. That, and I think you will come to that in the next presentation. Having just um, been on a committee meeting for a um, for a technology appraisal with Nice, I was actually really impressed with how they valued the patient involvement and the patient voice. Um, really listened to what we had to say and. And, and took it on board. So I think just, yeah, valuing that real world evidence is really important. And they are, you know, doing that well at the moment. Yeah, that's good to hear. In my experience, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so just having a look at the other questions. So one other question is what role the siloed budgets have in making system or societal impacts part of assessment? So I suppose this is, around the issue of having the HTA process very much focused on um, impacting how how the, the healthcare budget is allocated, but not necessarily thinking more uh, broadly. Um, Chris, what do you think when it comes well, to To be budget? honest, I, I think I might be very curious to hear Portia's thoughts. Um, in your experience, <laughs> has the process of, of presumably dealing with multiple government departments with their own budgets. How has that experience been for you? Have you, have you seen people trying to, to shuffle you off onto other people's budgets? Yeah, uh, yeah. The coordination of care is really horrendous, I would say. Um, with 
a condition where you have so many different disciplines so we have you know and and so many different teams in so many different places um yeah it's very difficult especially with budgeting sort of just coming down to Ezra's equipment for example so he has a BiPAP mask and the ventilator comes from the specialist hospital but then the tubing comes from the community team um if we need a second mask that budget comes from the community team um and it's actually quite confusing you know who do you ask for what pieces of equipment and they do try and 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 I, I hope that the new um, integrated care systems will bring an end to this eventually um, when the budget is you know per person within within their place because um, it is difficult and the coordination is not good even when it comes down to appointments you know I'll be asked to go up to London you know four different times sometimes in one month because they're just not talking to each other and um, yeah definite issue that needs to be solved. Uh, so if I, if I can way follow up on that one, uh, so I, I I think I would have the same opinion that budget silos aren't improving anything, and I think in the to the idea that maybe we would like to address the well being of the people within the system rather than necessarily just the health of the people within the system. That in particular, I think raises budget silo issues. Um, the expression is it's the national health service, not the national well being service. So. In that sense, they've they've drawn their own boundary around what it is they're concerned about. Um, but I, I think there is scope. It's not an insurmountable problem. It would be a, a big challenge, but it's not an insurmountable problem to to change the perspective that we take and, and shift from a relatively narrow health focus to to a broader well-being. Yeah, great points. And I think I think this really ties into one of the other questions we've had. I think this is a really um, key point. A lot of people are picking up on so one of the other questions was around considering the fact that hta's don't take a societal perspective um and the impact of carers burden might be outside of their budget what are the recommendations to change this this situation and i suppose it, it would be that yeah i think i would just say well-being over and over and over right okay so another question i think <sighs> We, we are probably going to get back to this next week, um, or almost certainly are going to, but a uh, highly upvoted question. Can maximizing societal qualities and maximizing patient qualities go in opposite directions? And uh, and if so, I'm not, not quite sure what the second part of that question says and, and what do you do about it perhaps? Um, yes, I think the short answer is yes, that can happen. We have seen that at least um, analytically. Uh, yeah, even if you'd like to comment. Portia, is it, would you like to hear anything <laughs> you would like to say? <laughs> I think measuring qualities is, is really, really difficult if you're not living it. Um, so, for example, if, if, if someone had told me when I was in um, the diagnosis um, sort of appointment, when I found that out, that you know, if you take this treatment, you will be taking a hospital home with you. You will have, you know, a ventilator, a suction machine. He won't be able to eat. He'll need 24-hour care. I probably would have said no to treatment because I would have judged that his quality of life wouldn't have been good enough, basically, in my opinion. But they didn't say that because they didn't know, and I'm really grateful they didn't because now, knowing what I know, I know the joy that it brings, um, and I know that his quality of life may be judged by someone else who's not living it they'd say that is not a good enough quality of life to justify that treatment but i know him and i know he has a great quality of life and i know he enjoys his day um so it's very difficult to explain to anyone that's not living it um that he does have a good quality of life because when you look at it on paper it doesn't look like he does so I, again i think real world evidence is really really important i don't know if um, that answers the question <laughs> I think the other half of the answer would be, again, opportunity cost is fundamental to everything that we do. That as soon as you try and spend money to make one thing better, it takes that same money away from spending it to make a different thing better. Um, again, I think I'll probably go back to my previous answer that that presents a challenge in how we conceptualize this stuff and and how we think about the value of, of this outcome compared to that outcome, we've become fairly good at understanding the value of 
adding quality, we're we're less good at understanding the value outside of the quality, um, family effects, societal effects. We're less we're less good not because we can't do it, just because we haven't done it up until now. And if we make a decision to move in that direction, we will become better at doing that. Thank you both of you. And I think there's a sort of a relate a question on a similar theme that I think would be interesting, uh, particularly Portia, to get your view on. So uh, the question is, how should we decide how much weight to give to care utility or, or qualities compared to, say, patients' own utility or, or qualities? What would your view be on that? I think they're so linked, it's difficult to separate them. Um, I think we need to look at it as sort of, um, going back to my primary school days, a team around the child approach, um, because the quality of life of the patient has such an effect on all the people around him or her. Um, yeah, I don't know how um, in economics you'd separate the two because they're so inextricably linked. Yeah, no, so I mean, from, from a pure modeling perspective, that they were mm. added added together to considered with the same amount of weight uh, but there has been some research to to explore whether that's whether society would agree that mm. we would give equal weight to to both the qualities of patient or qualities of an informal carer um so yeah it's a bit of an ongoing research question yeah, yeah. Think, and I almost think... unfair to make society judge when they they, they don't know what it's like it's, it's a very difficult mm. question yeah. Apologies again if this is if this puts you on the spot, but I would it is a it is a very interesting question. If if you could make Ezra's quality of life a bit better by making your quality of life slightly you know slightly larger in the in the other direction for you, would that be an acceptable trade off, or is it simply a sum? And if that sum is positive, then it's a good thing, and if it's negative, it's a bad thing. Yeah, I would say it's a sum. Um, his his well being and his quality of life and his happiness and his wellness has an immediate effect on mine. <laughs> I always say, you know, if, if Ezra's happy and well, I'm happy and well. You know, if Ezra's ill and in hospital, then you know my quality of life goes severely down. <laughs> you, you, you can't split the two; it has to be a combined thing. I think that's really interesting. It's something definitely to keep in mind when you're doing sort of research in that area to keep keep in mind the way those two are linked. It's it's important. Um, oh, another question that's well, maybe we should uh, sorry just reviewing the top questions. So we have a question around the fact that uh, carer or family qualities are often omitted from from HTA. Uh, They'd like to know what we think the primary reason is for that. So would either of you like to, to try and tackle that one uh, initially? Probably it's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, partly, I think Portia and, I, Portia and I are in total agreement, but it's, it's hard to do. Um, part of it might go back to this idea of the National Health Service is concerned with the the person who has the the tag on their wrist that says i am the patient and and i am your responsibility whereas the carer and the family perhaps are seen as less directly the responsibility of the healthcare system mm. yeah i'd agree i, I agree is especially that it, it is just a challenging thing to do and it's quite hard to collect the data so tying into the earlier questions around around data availability and so on i think that that makes uh, that, that would have a big impact. So I'm conscious of time. Uh, we've now got about a minute left, so I don't think we have any time for further further questions today. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Portia, for your presentations and your discussion um, in the Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have more in this series, two more to webinars to come. The next one is on Monday. And so we hope to see you there.